Yeah, thank you very much. And yeah, thanks very much to the organizers to putting together this conference. And thanks very much to letting me speak here on, on Bjorn's birthday conference. And I'm very honored to be able to do that. And at the same time, of course, a little bit in intimidated. I will be speaking about um, race methods and algebraic K theory. And of course, I mean, Bjorn has been at the forefront of the developments of this area for, I think, at least 30 years. And like the sheer amount of results he has achieved in this area is, is amazing. And I'm not going to try to sort of summarize Bjorn's like contributions. I think somehow he can do this much better. He has written a nice paper last year for the symposia of pure, as a pure mass symposia, which I think everyone should read. It's worthwhile reading. There you get a re really nice overview of trace methods and algebraic K-theory calculations using trace methods. And yeah, I recommend everyone can look at this paper. I, I, just one further recommendation, don't try to do the very last exercise. <laughs> so <laughs> this costed me a lot of time. <laughs> okay, so yeah, as I say, like I will talk about trace methods and I wanna talk a little bit about prismatic homology. So let me start with uh, giving you the motivation in the form of the theorem that we proved with Ben Antio. Achim Krause and myself proved this last year, but it unfortunately hasn't yet appeared. <laughs> Turns out to be a little bit complicated to write up some of the details, but here's the result. So it's about K theory of Z mod P to the N. And that has been an open question for a long time, and here's the results we obtain. So for i a large number, and I, I can give you a precise bound, but let me just say for i large, we have that k2i minus i of z mod p to the k, k is fixed, that this is zero. That's what we call the even vanishing. Then the second result is that the order of k2i minus one of z mod p to the k, that can be completely computed. So this is a finite group, and the order is as follows, equal to p to the i minus one times p to the i times k minus one. Okay, that, that's the order of this group, and this is like in the range where this vanishes. Somehow, I mean, by previous results of angled white, it was known what the quotient of the two orders is, and so somehow, because we know this is zero now, we can determine what this order is. Okay, that's the first result. And actually, we can do better. Um, not only can we compute the orders of these groups, but sort of even in the range where i is not large enough, there's an explicit description. So one way to express this result is there's an explicit co-chain complex given as follows. I mean, I will call this CPI round brackets z mod p to the k. And this co-chain complex takes the following form. It's given by z p i to the k minus one. That's a differential z p two i k minus one. And then there's another differential z p i k minus one. And then there's zeros from there on. So this is degree zero, and so in cohomological dimension I go up. And what is the value of this cotangent complex, uh, this cochain complex? It has a property that its cohomology computes the algebraic K groups. So with H zero of this cochain complex is zero, H one is actually K two I minus one of Z mod P to the K with p adic coefficients, so the p torsion in that finite group, and h2 is k2i minus 2 of z mod p to the k with p adic coefficients. Okay, so that is as good as we got in computing k, k theory of z mod p to the k. Right, you can now immediately like read this off from this co-chain complex, and this is super explicit. These are huge matrices. 
And these are explicit. Like they are so explicit, we feed them into a computer and sort of let Sage produce like huge tables for us. So we don't find, we didn't quite find a closed formula, but I mean, this is in some sense algebra. You have to give a closed formula for kernel and co-kernel, and because the matrices are defined inductively, I don't, at this point, we don't have a closed formula. But apart from that, I think it's as, almost as good as a closed formula. Okay, and maybe let me give you a third statement, also a statement about, about K theory of Z mod P to the K. Um, that is a statement about its chromatic behavior. So it is known by a recent result of um, Bud um, Clausen Matthew that uh, the K1 localization of K theory of Z mod P to the K is zero. And I guess it has been reproven by Lund, Meyer, Tamme. And we will give a, qualitative, a quantitative version of how, how zero the K1 localization is. Namely, what we say is the following. So the element V1, which is an element in K2P minus 2 of Z mod P to the K, now with FP coefficients. So by this, I just mean the mod P reduction of the spectrum. And that is nilpotent. This is basically what it means that the K1 localization is zero, right? In the telescope, the co-limit is zero, but I'm, say, I'm giving you the degree of exact degree. And the degree is the P version of K. So, but what, what is this? P to the K minus one over P minus one. So that's the exact degree of nilpotence. And of course, as usual, at p equals 2, you have to be a bit careful, because then there's no ring structure. This doesn't quite make sense. There's a v1 element, but not a v1 self-map. And so then you have to interpret this on a certain associated graded. But at all other primes, this is the exact bound of nilpotence of that element. OK. Good. So that's, that's a motivation. <laughs> Are there questions about that? And so the rest of the talk, I will spend explaining to you how these methods work that go into like computing such a result. And maybe I should say so somehow this CPI of Z mod P to the K, this is a syntomic complex that Tom was alluding to in the last talk. So maybe I should sort of in order to distinguish it from the motivic one, have like put up a little sin somewhere. So it's a syntomic complex. It's syntomic cohomology of Z mod P to the K. So in some sense, in reality, we are computing the syntomic cohomology of Z mod P to the K. Okay, but let me maybe sort of, I mean, maybe not everyone sort of knows what that means and why it is good to compute the syntomic cohomology and how the hell this has to do with algebraic K theory. Let me maybe give you like a little bit of an overview of that. And yeah, as I say, if there are any questions, please interrupt me at any, any point. OK, so how does a proof work? A proof uses trace methods. And there has been a little bit of a development in the last few years of trace methods. So maybe let me give you the perspective that I have on what trace methods actually are. And so the first thing is that, and maybe there I don't like sort of do justice to a lot of development, but let me say somehow in this case, we have this old theorem of McCarthy or Dundas McCarthy from the 90s, 96, I think. This implies that in order to compute K theory of Z mod P to the K, with p-adic coefficients, this is isomorphic to topological cyclic homology with, of z mod p to the k for star larger or equal zero. Um, yeah, why is that? I, think, I mean, the, the theorem of Dunas McCarthy tells you that the difference between k theory of z mod p to the k and k theory of F, fp and tc of z mod p to the k and tc of fp is the same. And so you, in order to prove that these are isomorphic, it's enough to prove that it's true for FP. And that, of course, is the very first computation in the field. And I mean, in the field of THH and TC, I should say. First thing that Bergstedt did, did after defining THH is he computed it for FP. Um, so 
let me mention one thing here. Of course, I'm, I'm writing p adic coefficients. I told you that k theory of z mod p to the k is a finite group. And so if you actually look at it with l adic coefficients, so away from the prime, then it's isomorphic to k theory of fp. It's basically a group homology calculation or GABA rigidity. Well, somehow, it was known for a long time what this is with l adic coefficients or the L-torsion for different primes. So somehow, in, in, in some sense, the whole problem, which was an open problem since the 70s to compute this, was like to compute it at the prime p. And that can be achieved by TC calculation. So somehow TC is a tool or trace methods are a tool to understand K-theory at the prime. It's kind of the, the upshot, which is maybe differentiates it a little bit from like the way motivic homology is sometimes used is more like used at looking at calculations away from the prime, at least classically. Okay, so that's the first thing. So this is kind of where, where this abstract result enters. And now at this point, we know we need to compute TC. And this, as I say, this is like known since the 90s. And so what about TC? What is TC? I mean, TC comes with a fiber sequence. And sort of most of the stuff I'm going to say work way more generally than for z mod p to the k, so let me just abbreviate this by r. So what is this fiber sequence? Fiber sequence will just sort of give you the spectrum Tc. So the Tc groups are, of course, homotopy groups of a spectrum that are also called Tc. And this sits in a fiber sequence with Tc minus. And here you have another thing, which is Tpr. And here's a map called phi minus kan gets the lovely name phi minus kan. Um, and yeah, I guess somehow these spectra are further sort of obtained as here you have THHR, topological Hochschild homology, and there you do a Tate construction as one, and here you do THHR, and then homotopy fixed points as one. So this is not relevant for us today, but somehow this is how these terms are defined, and I guess for general rings, I mean, I'm using here that this ring this guy is automatically p-complete, otherwise you would have to complete a completion here. Okay, so that is kind of the definition of TC. So in order to compute TC, somehow you would have to understand those terms. And now here's where the motivic filtration kicks in. Which gives you a filtration on that whole picture, which is what is actually useful. So the BMS filtration, which is the kind of TC version of the motivic filtration, which is also the so-called even filtration, I'll say a word on this in a second. What is that? That's a, this is a filtration on those spectra, by which I mean, you know, all of these guys get filtrations compatible with these, all these maps and who's associated graded, associated graded is the following. So the associated graded of TP, that's prismatic cohomology. I mean, that's a little bit of a fine print, but yeah, let me maybe, the I is associated graded, degree I. This is given by the so-called Nygaard completed prismatic cohomology. And so I, I ask you to like squint your eyes and ignore this and that. I don't know, I just write it because I feel bad writing wrong things, but <laughs> maybe we can ignore it. <laughs> okay, so that's the associated graded of a filtration on TP. And then the next term here is this guy actually comes with a filtration, so-called Nygaard filtration. And then you have here n larger equal i of this guy. Oh, yeah. And here again, I have phi minus kan maps. So that's the associated graded of a filtration on this guy. And then because we have this map, we also get a filtration on TC, which is now just the fiber of those two. And that is this ZPI of R, the syntomic homology. Right, okay, so that's kind of the way this works out. And yeah, let me comment a little bit on... Um, some things, maybe I should say this is prismatic cohomology, prismatic cohomology, and this is syntomic cohomology, syntomic cohomology. And of course, um, nowadays we have this beautiful way of thinking about this filtration 
which is due to uh, Hahn, Ruxit, Wilson, which is that this is a filtration that exists like absurdly general. So if R is a commutative ring, then TPR is an E infinity ring spectrum, and they have this amazing observation that every E infinity ring spectrum has this filtration. And how do they do this filtration? They just say, well, if it was even, you know, only concentrated in even degrees, we just do the double speed Posnikov tower. Right, that's a good filtration. If we're even, we just put every like every one in a single degree, every homotopy group. And in general, of course, spectra are not even, but I mean I can just map in all possible ways to even filtrations, to even ring spectra and pull back the filtration. It's a right Kahn extension from even ring spectra. That's what, what they call the even filtration, and every ring spectrum has this even filtration, and, and shockingly, this is like a useful thing to do. Like <laughs> And somehow it turns out that actually in this case, it literally, I guess, and I mean, there's some fine print which I'm ignoring, R, R is atomic ring, but okay. So it recovers actually the butt moro scholz filtration. And though from this perspective, you say this is a very general thing we have here and here. And so the theorem of butt moro scholz is maybe the identification of the associated graded. But actually, in fact, what they do in their paper, they use this even as a definition. They construct the filtration and define this term as a zero is graded. So in some sense, you could sort of say, well, now that we know the filtration exists super generally, we just make this a definition. And of course, then it's kind of semi-useful, but I mean, it's defined. <laughs> and then somehow later work, and that's what I will go through today, is somehow give a purely algebraic way of thinking about these terms. And then all of a sudden it becomes super useful, right? Because we want to compute homotopy theory, we have something, some associated graded, and then we have an algebraic description of that associated graded. That's Does that mean the even filtration is the one we did under TPR also, or is that different? Uh, I think it's also true, yes, but sort of, I mean, it's also the fiber of the even filtrations here. Somehow it's just the case that somehow, oh no, actually it's different, sorry. It's different. So what happens somehow is like you, you have a sort of so-called even faithfully flat cover, a quasi symptomic cover where those two terms are even, but then of course the fiber doesn't have to be even. So I think somehow in this topology, this locally will be concentrated in two adjacent degrees. So yes, I take back what I initially said. Yeah. But <laughs> yes, okay, so um, good. But so eventually what we get is, of course, we have a spectral sequence, I guess, would be the more classical way of thinking about that. Is there's a motivic style spectral sequence where the J's cohomology of that ZPIR and it converges conditionally to 2C, 2I minus JR. Okay, so that's the spectral sequence we get from this uh, filtration. And that's the way I think about like trace methods these days. You somehow have these like sort of have TC and then you have filtrations on TC. And as I say, like this filtration exists super generally, like even for ring spectra. So I'm presenting the picture for ordinary rings here. This is where this deserves the name, namely prismatic cohomology, and where we'll give you an algebraic description. But in principle, this exists for ring spectra, and people are at the moment, and maybe I'll say something about it at the end, are sort of at the moment on like giving like algebraic or semi-algebraic descriptions of the associated graded for ring spectra. For example, of KU algebras or something like that. Okay. And as I say, so this, this result is basically an identification of the syntomic cohomology. So the associated graded, these syntomic guys are chain complexes, and we are identifying this chain complex very explicitly here. Okay, so. What is, I mean, what is the actual statement we prove? Now that we understand like trace methods in that way, we can just translate what we actually prove. And that's the following result. The result is that for R equals Z mod P to the K, we have that 
this prismatic cohomology, this Nygaard completed prismatic cohomology, I is concentrated in degree minus one. In degree minus one. Co homological degree minus one. Cohomological degree one. And so the same is true for the Nygaard filtration. So this implies actually that the syntomic cohomology, ZP IR, is actually concentrated in degrees minus one and minus two. Right, because it's a fiber of things concentrated in degree minus one. You sort of have stuff in degree minus one and minus two. And so this means that the spectral sequence immediately collapses and that the result I wrote down earlier, namely that TC is just given by the cohomologies of these guys. So it's given by the H1 for star equals 2i minus 1 and H2 by star equals 2i minus 2. Right, and here I'm using cohomological notation. So when I say degree minus 1, that means H1 is non-zero and so on. So the moment you, you, you know these like Connectivity bounds, you immediately get that. Okay? And let me say that this is, I mean, I'm, I'm saying proposition, but I mean, this is maybe like, more like a corollary of earlier work. So somehow you can, you can give soft arguments to get these like connectivity bounds using, yeah, so-called Hodge-Tate comparison. That's something I did with Achim in earlier work. Um, so to see that somehow, if like, you know, if you, if you go through everything that you know, like without having to compute a lot and all the dust has settled, then you actually understand in the end, we just have to calculate these complexes and somehow these two cohomology groups of these complexes. No big I, what was it? Yes, yeah, so there's no big I. So the big I, you know, that was kind of the, the the even vanishing. So what is even vanishing? The even vanishing tells me that the H2 has to vanish. Right, so what does this mean? This means up there, if I know like my, my two guys are both concentrated in degree minus one, I have to actually show that the map is surjective, can minus phi, right? And this doesn't always happen in all degrees, but it happens in big enough degrees. So that you get by analyzing exactly what phi minus can is. Kind of then, then it's a fine analysis of what is going on. But you're absolutely right that somehow this is just a statement about this like whole atomic complex just concentrated in a single degree. Yes. Okay. Um, I think it's false sometimes, and I think also somehow. In some like moral sense, the Nygaard completed guy is the correct thing. So, so an, to compute that syntomic cohomology, you can also replace that. Yes, but somehow, for example, very often it turns out that the non Nygaard completed one is all over the place, not even in a single degree, and the Nygaard completed is in a single degree. So, for example, the non Nygaard completed one will in generally not enjoy good descent properties, where the Nygaard completed has actually faithfully flat descent. So, yeah, it turns out that the Nygaard completed is the better one, and also our methods, so I, I mean, I don't want to talk about this too much, but sort of we put a further filtration, and we have to complete with this further filtration, and by this method, we only get our hands on the Nygaard completed guy. Yes, okay, so good, and so, okay, that was three. And now, the specifics of the situation, there's a key trick that we employ to get this. And by the way, bear with me. I was saying I will give an elementary introduction into prismatic cohomology. I will do that. I just want to sort of motivate why I need that and what I actually need on the way already introducing the symbols. So the key, key trick is to use descent along a certain map of ring spectra, along the map from the sphere to the spherical group ring Z, by which I just mean the suspension spectrum of the natural numbers. Right, that's a flat A1, an E-infinity ring spectrum. And I mean, I will make my ring, I mean, I guess any ring really, but in this case, Z mod P to the N, I can make it an algebra over that by setting Z to P. Right, and so what I get is actually, I can look at TP of R, and maybe TP of R really is TP of R relative to the sphere. 
let me make it explicit to write the sphere spectrum. That's what topological periodic homology is, right? Ordinary periodic homology you would say relative to the integers. TP is relative to the sphere. And now what I can do is I can form the same thing R relative to S bracket Z because I made my R an algebra over S bracket Z. And now I want to do descent. So the next thing I would do is I would look at the Amitsuo complex of this map, the descent complex. So the next term would be two copies of that tensored over the sphere with itself. So that's a TP of R relative and now two variables, Z0 and Z1. And then, I mean, you get the next terms and the descent thing. This is like R relative three variables, Z0, Z1, Z2. All, all the ZIs are the same. Yes, all the ZIs are mapping to the same P, absolutely. Yes, okay, and so the claim is that this is, this is a, a limit diagram. Right, so this is the limit of this co-simplicial diagram. That's kind of, it satisfies descent within the base, replacing the sphere by SC and doing descent in that variable. Okay, so that's kind of what we're gonna do, and somehow this is also an old trick that sort of, I guess Achim and I had imply, um, employed earlier and sort of Liu and Wang have also like successfully used this exact trick. And so, step five, um, theorem. And this is maybe somehow one of the theorems I wanna to explain today. And this says there are compatible filtrations extending, I guess, EMS or even. And then, uh, as I say, like maybe this is again not a theorem. I'm saying like all terms here also have an even filtration. If you use the even filtration perspective, that's clear because everyone has an even filtration. But I guess so, somehow what I'm saying is then I'm identifying the associated graded, right? So, so there's always this kind of thing, you can either construct a filtration where you understand the associated graded and then somehow you wanna, <laughs> or you sort of do this abstract thing and then you have to identify the associated graded. And so there are filtrations on this whole picture with graded, with graded and now, now I have like here, I mean here the graded, as I said before, is prismatic homology and I got completed and then I have sort of relative prismatic cohomologies are relative and now relative to the polynomial ring, which is pi naught of that guy. So that's another term. That's relative prismatic cohomology. And then you go on. You have somehow terms like this. Z0, Z1, prismatic cohomology, and so on. And so read this as introducing me introducing a new symbol, <laughs> namely this symbol. Now, now I'm allowed to stick like a ring relative to some base. And I will tell you what, what the exact situation is. But sort of in this whole situation and really actually, you know, I'm, I, I will be unable to draw this, but there's also such a, I mean, TC and TC minus also have such a limit diagram and there are compatible filtrations there as well. So really I have like a fiber sequence of co-simplicial spectra and filtrations everywhere and Nygaard filtrations and so on. Now can everyone think of this situation? Like I, I, I'm not gonna attempt to draw it, but it's three, three augmented co-simplicial diagrams under each other and everyone has a filtration and the associated graded is like such a thing with like Nygaards and, and symptomic complexes. Okay, so that's kind of maybe the result and the necessity for doing this, and maybe let me write one last sentence before I sort of totally switch gears and start from zero about prismatic homology. So in the case of interest, in the case R equals Z mod P to the K, all these, all these terms, and by these terms I mean these terms here. <laughs> All the terms in the co-simplicial thing are discrete. And by discrete, I mean chain complexes concentrated in degree zero. 
and the Hopf algebraoid is one dimensional. So it's a one dimensional Hopf algebraoid. Right, this co simplicial diagram, which is then a priori just a co simplicial diagram of actual rings, because everyone is discrete, this is a one dimensional Hopf algebraoid. Right, and we give like very explicit formulas of all these terms. So what does this mean? This means actually we, you know, being one dimensional means somehow we only, in order to compute its cohomology, we only have to care about the first three terms. Or maybe the first term and the primitives in here. Those terms where the alternating differential goes to zero. Right, because I mean, this is a very concrete statement. This guy just, without knowing the one dimensionality, I mean, after knowing that all of these are discrete, this just means this guy is actually a co-chain complex which is the Dolt Kahn of this co-simplicial thing. And then I'm saying even more, I'm saying this co-chain complex has the property that its cohomology in high enough degrees vanishes. And that's somehow the first start of, our, of the co-chain complex I wrote down earlier. This is just basically choosing bases for these terms. Like, Okay, is this strategy clear, what we're doing here? And then I sort of, now I want to sort of, yes? Hmm? What is S? Oh, oh, sorry. Achim Krause, Nikolaus. I don't know. I'm messed up. Achim, sorry. Sorry, Achim, if you see this. <laughs> no. Okay, so now, now again, uh, this is the strategy, and this somehow necessitates to introduce all these symbols and to be able to compute with those. And now I want to introduce those symbols and give you an algebraic description of it. Well, I mean, the, you, you wrote this 94 paper together with what's the basis of that theorem. Okay, so then I have to add, I, I'd rather add further people. <laughs> Bergstedt. Matzen. I mean, I think somehow what Bjorn is referring to, I think in this 96 paper, McCarthy did the case of simplicial rings, and then Bjorn did the case of S algebras. But the way I see it, somehow the, the 94 Ennis paper, where sort of the stable theories are identified, and together with Lars's paper, were the basis of all of this. So that's why I think somehow it's, it's fair to put everyone's name here. Thanks. <laughs> but I'm going to erase everything anyhow. <laughs> okay. Um, good. So prismatic cohomology. Prismatic cohomology. And I mean, I, I, I'm going to fix the prime p. And so the basis of prismatic cohomology is a notion of a prism, which I want to quickly introduce now. And um, I guess it's based on the notion of a delta ring, aka theta ring in homotopy theory. But let me call it delta ring. Delta ring is a commutative ring A. with a Frobenius lift, lift phi. What is a Frobenius lift? I mean, if I, if I go mod p, my ring has a Frobenius homomorphism, sending x to x to the p. And this is a map, an integral ring homomorphism, which has the property that mod p, it, it, it gives a Frobenius. And so if a doesn't have p torsion, which will be the case today, this is a correct definition, otherwise I want to I add a word derived here. <laughs> and then it's always a correct definition. Because, you know, if you have p torsion, then there's a distinction between the derived mod p reduction and the actual mod p reduction. If you use animated commutative rings to do, to say everything, then it's, it's also equivalent to saying a derived Frobenius lift. Okay, so that's what a delta ring is. And what is a prism? A prism is a delta ring. Delta ring A, 
together with an invertible ideal. Invertible ideal I, I in A, such that first um, A is I comma P complete. Um, and I mean, in case of question about which exact completion, I'm going to assume uh, it's bounded order of P torsion. Otherwise, derived completion is the right thing to do. And the second statement is the prism condition, which says P is in I plus phi uh, I A. OK, that's, that's a prism condition. And um, what's a way to think of a prism? Maybe I, I draw the, my favorite prism picture. <laughs> so he, here's, here's the way I think about a prism. Think about a prism as somehow being two-dimensional. This is like spec A. And then I, have, uh, then I have like on this axis maybe this red thing is spec A mod I. And then the next thing is uh, spec A mod phi i. And then maybe the next thing is spec A mod phi squared i, and so on. Maybe what, what are the next colors, green and blue, and so on. And so what does the prism condition say? The prism conditions say they actually inter intersect in spec A mod P, right? What does this mean? Like the prism condition is P is an I plus phi I A. That means those, the red and the orange line intersect in the white thing. I mean, I'm not saying the white thing is the intersection of the two, but somehow they intersect in the white thing. And so somehow, informally, I think of a prism as, I mean, somehow, in some sense, a prism a, you want to think of a sort of nil thickening of A mod I. Right? It's like a topological nil thickening because it's I complete. And somehow this like infinitesimal structure that it gives, gives to A mod I, that you can think of as this kind of rainbow picture. It gives you this sort of stratification. I mean, it's not quite a stratification, but that's the way I want to think about it. So somehow the underlying ring, in some sense, of a prism is A mod I. And it's like a nil thickening of this. Like if you think of A mod I as a point, or maybe here it's a line, then it's, it's, a, nil, it's a nil potent like in, inner structure you give to that point or the, to that small thing. OK, so, but of course, I mean, this definition still is completely unmotivated. The, the fact that this makes, I mean, it's useful or makes any sense is still like some sort of magic to me. Like, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I know how they came up with it, but somehow that it works so well is like really surprising. Okay, good. Are there questions about prisms? Yes. So let me give you examples. I guess I give you two. So here's a here's the easiest possible prism. It's just uh, where you do the p-adic numbers. That becomes a delta ring by phi equals the identity, right? Because I guess mod p this is x to the p by whatever Fermat's little theorem or something. And um, then the ideal in this case is just P. And that actually means, I mean, the prism condition is trivially satisfied because P is already contained in P. So that's a so-called crystalline prism. And that's because Christ prismatic cohomology with respect to this prism is isomorphic to crystalline cohomology. That's why it's called the crystalline prism. And the second example is just the one we will employ. It's the P the power series ring in Z, the Frobenius will just be sending Z to Z to the P. Again, this is obviously a Frobenius lift because mod P is just, uh, I guess, the Frobenius sending Z to Z to the P. And then the prism structure here is actually Z minus P. And there it's already not completely trivial to modify, uh, to, to verify that this is actually a prism. So for those of you who know all this, or like are bored or don't know, you can just try to prove that this is a prism. The prism condition is satisfied. OK, so this is called the Broekissen prism. So these are the two prisms we will care about today. 
And you can be more general, like everything I said today actually works more general for complete DVRs, rings of integers. And so there you would somehow put a, an Eisenstein polynomial here. If you know the way that sort of complete DVRs arise, then somehow you know you can get all of them when you sort of replace this by the Witt vectors and this by Eisenstein polynomials. So that also gives you prisms. Okay, so that's kind of what I would do here. Are there further questions? Okay, if not, then let me maybe give you the definition of prismatic homology. <laughs> So definition, are any ring commutative? And then what is prismatic homology? And this is absolute prismatic homology, prism R. This is just the inverse limit over all ways of mapping from R to B mod J, B. Where this is like B comma J is a prism. And this limit, of course, here I consider B to be an object in the derived category of the integers. And then I ca carry out this limit. This is a homotopy limit in this derived category. Right, it can sort of get negative homotopy groups. This is like a complex. And so why is that? <laughs> so what, how do you think of this? I, I personally think of this as some sort of version, algebraic version of Czech cohomology. Right, imagine we had like a topological space. We want to define its singular cohomology. How, how can we do this? What we can do is we can look at the category of all contractible open sets in our space. And to every contractible open set, I will just assign the integers. Constant functor which assigns the integers to every contractible open set. And now I take the limit over all possible ways of mapping contractible open sets in my space. And then this limit will produce for you like Czech cohomology. And so here somehow I think of B mod J's like as sort of contractible open sets, like points or something, thickened up points, but they're thickened up, they have some inner structure. The B is an inner structure on B mod J. And so it's kind of a Czech cohomology, except I'm shooting at my thing with more interesting points than I would sort of in topology. Okay, so that's the way I think about, uh, this is prismatic cohomology. And this I, th I think I should say is due to Bart Scholze. And this specific variant, absolute prismatic cohomology, has been studied by Bud Lurie quite a bit. Okay, and this already defines, like, I mean, basically this term after squinting. Right after ignoring some sort of decorations. And um, <laughs> now let me also define these relative terms here. Right, because somehow that was kind of key in this whole computation that these relative terms exist and are fully functorial. And that's relative prismatic cohomology. And how does this work? So for this, you want to say that A is a delta ring. Not necessarily a prism, but a delta ring, and, and R is a ring under R, under A. R is a ring map. So R is just a ring under A, and A is a delta ring. And then somehow I want to define relative prismatic cohomology to be also a limit. And now again, it's a limit over B, but now B is a little bit more complicated. You have your map A to R, and you look at all possible ways to look at mapping from R to B mod J, but you want to say that this map up here lifts, so this has to be a delta map. Right, so this map is given, this map is given, you, you take the limit over all prisms, but then you choose this pairs of maps like this, where the upper one is a prism map. Okay, so this is a limit defining relative prismatic homology. Okay, so that's the definition, and I should say this definition is due to us in this form, and somehow, but Scholze, if A is a prism, and R is an A mod I algebra.
And I mean, in some sense, we just observed that you never needed that A was a prism. You can just write it for delta ring. And of course, maybe this is a little bit of a stupid observation, but sort of the thing behind the scenes is that this is a useful definition, which I try to justify now. OK, but somehow it's very important. Somehow this shows actually in particular that prismatic homology, even in the bud scholze setting, where this is a prism, is like fully functorial even in maps, I mean, that don't respect the prism structure. Even if you just put yourself in the bud scholze setting, then this is like showing you it has more functoriality than they initially exhibited in the initial paper. And that's very important for us because in this Amitsur complex I wrote down where I work first relative one variable and then relative two, these are not maps of prisms, if you think it's true. I'm not going to make it explicit now, but the maps you get in this complex, all, all terms can be exhibited as relative prismatic homology in the classical setting, but the maps not. And so it's not so clear how to describe this as a totalization diagram. That's kind of what necessitated this generalization of prismatic homology. OK, questions? Good, so let me give you a bunch of facts, maybe in ascending order of complexity. So this, yes? I mean, the, the forgetful functor from algebra to d of z preserves limits. So you could just say, yeah, and maybe here I could say this actually canonically lives in d of a. But there's way more structure on it, and somehow all the structure is kind of algebraic that is preserved by these limits. Yes. Um, OK, so good. So that's this thing. The first easy observation is that, of course, if I do prism r, the absolute one is just equivalent to prism r relative the integers. Right, so in some sense, this like relative prismatic homology generalizes Bud Scholze as well as the absolute side, just because you, you have this guy. And in, in, in prisms, you can't do that because you can't put a prism structure here so that every algebra is, a, is an algebra over the quotient. Right, so this is a more general thing. Second observation is uh, computing limits is hard, but there's like one exact case where it's easy. And what is that case? If the indexing category has a term, uh, initial object. <laughs> so let's say if this site, right, if this category over which we take the limit has an initial object, like in particular b comma j, a prism, then of course, I mean, the prismatic homology of r relative a, this is just given by this initial object b. But this is just when, yeah, the one case where you can compute limits. Okay, and I mean, <laughs> this sounds like a little bit of an academic thing to say, or like an edge case, but it's not really an edge case because this actually happens a lot. So this is like observation three, and maybe this is like something me telling you. This happens a lot. And um, I mean, there's a precise statement about a basis in the quasi-syntomic cohomology, but let me, maybe let me rather give you an example. <laughs> E.g., um, for example, if we want to calculate z mod p to the k relative to say, a single variable. And then here again, this variable goes to p. Right, this is a delta ring where z goes to z to the p. So this term is now well defined. And so in this case, it turns out actually that this happens. This has an initial object, this site. And not only does it have an initial object, there's an explicit formula. It's the so-called prismatic envelope. What is the explicit formula? It will look like this. I mean, I, I just throw the formula at you. Take this guy. And then you delta ring adjoin an element z to the k over z minus p. And then you complete. That's the formula. And here somehow this means delta ring adjoin, right? This is a delta ring. And then in the world of delta ring, I adjoin a new generator, which gets this lovely fractional name. And that's indicating that in delta rings, if I multiply this guy with z minus p, I get z to the k. So it just Turn out, I mean, do you do this operation in delta rings. And this is somewhat complicated of a process, but it's explicit, right? We exactly know how the free delta ring looks like. It's a, it's a push out in delta rings. And that's kind of all the other terms in my co simplicial diagram get similar formulas. 
you know, you can choose an additive basis of the thing somehow. This is super explicit. You know, like explicit is not always good, but it's explicit. <laughs> So, okay, so that's kind of what happens here. And yeah, somehow this is, I mean, you just get at, get at these like formulas by contemplating what it would mean to have an initial object in that, in that site, actually. So that's the beauty of prismatic homology, that you have these super explicit um, forms. And I guess I could say one word here. I mean, there's a topology on all rings, on all quasi-syntomic rings, the so-called quasi-syntomic topology and in this quasi-syntomic topology there's a basis of rings for which this happens where there's an initial object quasi-regular semi-perfectoids and we have a notion of relatively quasi-regular semi-perfectoids which form a basis so what this tells you is actually can always sort of reduce to this situation where you have these explicit like prismatic envelopes no matter which calculation you run up to descent you can do that and the necessary descent, maybe let me write this down, the necessary descent is that prism R relative A um, has so-called quasi-syntomic descent, atomic descent in R and faithfully flat descent in, in A. Fully flat descent, descent in A. And what we did is we, we played with this descent in A. We wanted to compute this term, and we compute it by computing this term, and then the term modulo two variables, and so on and so forth. So that's kind of like this kind of us wanting to do that necessitated developing this whole theory of relative prismatic homology. Or, you know, I don't know if it's actually necessitated it, but it felt like the right thing to do. Okay. <laughs> Good. And um, last fact, I did slightly lie to you. You also said that if you restrict the prism to A, that it would be faithfully flat descent does not hold. I mean, if you, if you restrict to prisms, then, I mean, you mean like maps of prisms? Yeah. No, it holds, but like the maps in question are not maps oh, of yeah. prisms. You know, somehow, if you, if you do like the polynomial ring in two variables, then you have to make a choice, like in which variable you put the prism structure. You want to put a Broekism prism structure, Z minus P, and then you have to make a choice which of the two variables. And for every variable, only one of the two maps in the Amitur complex will be a map of prisms. So somehow that's, that's kind of the problem. The maps will not be compatible. Of course, if you have maps which happen to be maps of prisms, then it will have this descent. But I mean, practice, I mean, I don't know many situations where this happens. Some of the new input here is that we give ourselves this base variable to play with and to descend in the base variable, where the classical bud scholz approach would be, or bud lurie approach would be to look at descent in R. That's kind of maybe in some sense a new thing. And we know this has to happen because we knew it, I mean, we knew it from topology by doing this descent from, T, from TP. Okay, so anyways, let me uh, say one last thing is uh, I did slightly lie about the definition of prismatic homology. Um, because the limit is carried out in DZ and uh, it lands in non-connective things. I mean, which category would it have to be the initial thing? Take the limit in algebra. Yes, so what you can do is you can look at derived delta rings. Well, derived delta rings are delta rings which are allowed to have negative homotopy groups, like co delta rings, but also animated. And then uh, it's true that it's, it's the initial object if A is a prism, in general not. I mean, yeah, there's some stacky nature to the initial object called the W card or sigma by Grinfeld, and yeah, it's just not true, I guess, what I'm saying. <laughs> it is true in some situations if you interpret it correctly, though. Okay, um, let me now for the thir third time say that I lied to you. I lied to you in the sense that the definition I gave to you is not always the correct definition. It is the correct definition in nice cases, in all cases that come up, and otherwise you, you left can extend from polynomial rings. So this is like, yeah. What, I, what I'm talking about here is like derived prismatic cohomology, and only for quasi-syntomic rings does it agree with the definition I gave you. Okay, um, last thing is now, how do we connect back to topology? Because we started off with a descent in topology, and then we like went on this algebra route, and now I want to get back to topology, and I will only do um, 
the easy version now, or one version. There's more to be that, but I mean, setting is here. I want to let SA be a Moore spectrum, an E infinity Moore spectrum, commutative Moore spectrum. What is a Moore spectrum? It's a spectrum which is connective and has homology exactly in a single degree. So the integral homology of this guy is just concentrated in a single degree, and that's the ring A, right? An ordinary ring, ordinary commutative ring. Right, that's what a Moore spectrum. A Moore spectrum is just a spectrum with homology in a single degree. And of course, I mean, Moore spectra as spectra are unique, but the question whether they have like unique, I mean, they have commutative ring structures is a subtle question that I, I guess we've studied a lot recently. But sort of here, I want to assume we have one of those. For example, the spherical polynomial ring is a good example. Well, that's a Moore spectrum. Its homology is just the ordinary polynomial ring. That's the example uh, that came up so far. And then here's one proposition. And that is a little bit hard to attribute. Maybe I put my name, but there's a lot of other names. Um, first of all, if you are in the situation, and maybe actually for simplicity, let me assume that SA is p-complete and say it's p-complete. Then, I mean, the first statement is then actually... So, so in this case, is that really... What? I mean, SA. I mean, if we fix A, I mean, do you have any different, different SA that gives you the same? Um, this is a very hard question. Um, a priori, you, you want, if you want to compare with the previous picture, somehow you, you stand with the respective base, and somehow you can work. I mean, let me let me maybe write down let, let me write, maybe write down the comparison, and then you can ask again, and we can sort of discuss it because it's easier. I think I think you know what I'm getting at, but like maybe not everyone. So I'm sort of maybe let me write it down, and then we discuss this again. Okay. So, A inherits the structure of a delta ring. Of a delta ring. So, in other words, whenever you can lift your commutative ring to the sphere, you have a Moore spectrum, then A has to have the structure of a delta ring. Um, there's a bunch of ways of seeing that. One is using the Tate valued Frobenius and a version of the Siegel conjecture. Another perspective would be to use K1 local homotopy theory, because, I mean, you can just check out that the KU homology in degree zero is still A of SA, and, and the KU homology always has like that, the theta P structure. There's a bunch of ways of seeing that, but somehow, in some sense, it's kind of a necessary condition for A to lift to the sphere would be to have a delta ring structure. And the second thing is SA is a cyclotomic base. Atomic base, i.e. relative TP, TC, etc., makes sense. Right, in general, if you have some ring spectrum, you can form relative to it, THH, relative to that E infinity ring, but I mean, it doesn't inherit a cyclotomic structure. So here, this has the necessary structure to make this all well defined. And then somehow the theorem, which maybe is the last thing I want to write down, theorem is that, I mean, for every R, for every A algebra R, There is a there are filtrations on this prismatic, I mean T C R relative S A mapping to T C minus R relative S A mapping to T P R relative S A with associated graded this newly defined prismatic homology relative to delta rings. So here you have prism R relative A, and then, I mean, there's a Frobenius twist and a Nygaard completion and a broyle kissin twist. <laughs> okay, and then you have Nygaard larger equal I, prism R1 brackets I, and then here you have like the syntomic homology. So what I'm basically saying here is we can define relative syntomic homology relative to a delta ring. So far, it was only defined relative either to a prism or relative to the p-addicts. 
And I'm saying not only can we define it, this is what I said before, but it has a property that it connects to the topological theory. Okay, and so again, like you can sort of say, okay, the filtration is the even filtration in fact, but then, I mean, this identifies the associated graded of the even filtration in that case. And so maybe, maybe as a last corollary, um, maybe a corollary of the proof, let me write down that if R is A mod I, then you get from this a sort of thing that I call ultimate Bergstedt periodicity. <laughs> This is like, you can compute R relative to SA. So basically the situation is we have a prism and we have a lift of the delta ring to the sphere. That's what I call a spherical prism. So for such a spherical prism we can compute this and this is actually given by I mod N to I mod N plus one in degree two N and zero else. Okay, so I, this is like what I call ultimate Bergstedt periodicity and I do so because this generalizes all known forms of Bergstedt periodicity. I mean, there were a couple forms that people have proven. I mean, notably Bergstedt's or original form for in which case you would take uh, A to be ZP and I mean the crystalline prism. And this admits a sphere to the, a lift to the sphere, namely the sphere itself. And then you get this. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say. Let me finish by saying one little story, if I may, um, namely uh, how I got to know Bjorn. <laughs> and that was, I mean, somehow I, I sat down the other day and tried to remember this, and it turns out this was like way back in the day, like 2011 in Hamburg. Birgit uh, and Andy Baker had organized a conference uh, called Structured Ring Spectra, and a lot of people were actually here. I think a lot of people in the audience, I think Magdalena was there, for example, Steffen was there, Birgit, Bjorn. A lot of people were actually there and somehow it was a beautiful conference and sort of, at the time I was, I just finished my PhD in, in mathematical physics. I had like very little clue about homotopy theory. But I sort of thought it was such a nice conference. The community is so nice. And I got to know Bjorn somehow. I was talking with Tony Elmdorf at the time and then Bjorn and I started chatting and I thought of, was super amazed by like how friendly Bjorn was and how he was willing with me as a young student who had no clue about homotopy theory. We were talking about group completion of dendroidal sets and like started to learn algebraic K theory and somehow was a little bit unsure at the time what I wanted to do but after this conference, and I think I never told this, but somehow after this conference, I know for sure that I wanted to go into homotopy theory. It's such a nice area and so nice people. Thanks, Bjorn. Thank you so much. Are there questions? Yes. <clears throat> um, I don't think motivic complexes exist in this generality. No, no, I but you mean in the, in the absolute case, yes, I think so. Ah. Um, yeah, I don't, to be honest, I don't know. I mean, here, I mean, I, maybe I, I can ask, this to the motivic people somehow. I mean, here it's very crucial to have A being a delta ring. And I, I haven't seen like delta rings play any sort of role in this motivic business. So maybe, I mean, maybe this is, I mean, this could be indicating indication for two things, either like you guys should bring <laughs> delta rings into the motivic picture, or maybe this is not yet not sort of exhibiting the right sort of generality. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, good. that's a great suggestion. I don't know. Oh. So does this, does this commutation inside Yes. Yes, but I mean, if you ask me whether it's completely independent, that's a different question. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I mean, you know, the case, I mean, this, form, this theorem, literally, if you, if you input A being ZP, the crystalline prism, 
and then R is, is just FP, then this is just reduces to Bergstadt periodicity. It's just the computation of THH FP. And it is true that the computation of THH FP formally implies the hopkins mahova theorem and like the computation of the dual Steenrod algebra and all of that. But I mean, to make this useful, you'd have to come up with an independent proof of the computation of THH FP, which somehow, I mean, Bergstedt's original proof uses like the computation of the dual Steenrod algebra and Steinberger's calculation of the Dyer-Leshoff operations. But it turns out one can give an independent proof Sort of in a, in a paper with Akil and um, Saul and, and Clark, we, we prove that TR has polynomial functoriality, and then we, we adopt an argument of Quillen. Quillen has this beautiful argument using lambda operations, why k theory of FP at the prime P is discrete. If you adopt this argument, you get that it's discrete, which, which implies Bergstedt theorem. So that, that is true. You can, you can give a proof along those lines and get back all these theorems purely by staring at the functoriality of K-theory, or TR in this case. Yes? Mark? Yeah, I think you said a few words about these uh, um, geometric models of this Navista module in the components that you alluded to at the beginning. Mm. Like Delta R for all the components, and Delta R for all the Sorry, what did I say? Delta R? Oh, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, of course, like, I guess that is just, you, you take TP of an E-infinity ring, and you put the even filtration on it, and you look at the associated graded, and, I mean, you can try to understand this. And in general, I think this is hard, but um, I guess maybe we want to understand this in cases where R is an, maybe an MU algebra or a KU algebra. And in that case, you can prove that you have enough of these like even faithfully flat covers. Like for example, for KU itself, you would somehow work relative to maybe MU. And it turns out MU is also a cyclotomic base. And then you can write down somehow what's the structure that would be corresponding to a delta ring. And that looks way more complicated. That has to do with the, the power operations you get over MU. And I think at this point, I think Robert Berglund has told me he also has studied that. And yeah, I guess at this point, we don't have a quite independent description, but we somehow roughly know how the description of this thing would look like. Yes, and I guess yeah, that's maybe the most concrete thing I want to say today. I was yeah, planning to say, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, yeah. Maybe, I, I, don't, I don't know how to say, I'm mean, happy to, to explain thing, a little bit more what I know, but it's mostly speculative. I don't really know like how to do this, like how to give an independent description of that. But I mean, it exists, right? The even filtration exists, the associated graded exists, so we have a definition of prismatic homology in that, gen, in that generality. Whether or not this is a useful thing and can be described independently is a hard question. Yes. Yeah, I mean, TC exists, TP exists, takes a filtration, takes a fiber. Absolutely. So I guess in some sense, maybe this says that the ital fight motivic filtration exists. And then, yeah. Yeah, I've been, yeah, I've been wondering for a long time what the generality is in which we expect a motivic filtration. And for some reason, I always thought animated commutative ring. But now I'm not so sure anymore. I think this basically gives it to you, like at least after etal chiffification or flat chiffification, it gives it to you uh, for arbitrary E infinity rings. And in fact, actually, there's recent work of Piotr who proves that this actually makes sense if R is an E2 ring. <laughs> then somehow what he does is he says, well, if R is an E2 ring, then TH8 and TP and so on are E1 rings. And then he proved that actually you don't need to map to even like E infinity rings, you can just do a module thing. You map to even modules, so to say, if you have a ring and modules over it. And, and that, that proof that these filtrations, in fact, even, I mean, I don't know, for what, what, whatever it's worth, exists for E2 rings. Um, this might be useful, for example, if you study BP point to brackets n. Yes. Or BP itself, I guess. Okay.